We're going to start with the single most important family of uh, conformal maps, which are called the linear fractional transformations. So, so if you're curious to follow along in Marsden and Hoffman, this is uh, the subject of chapter 5.2. If you want some additional reading material, I'm going to be pulling in stuff from uh, a book by Saracen, which I will link the title of, and then there will be a couple of web pages that I pulled. The, when I put the Remod Sphere stuff in, there will be some, uh, some web pages on the Remod Sphere. But I'll, I'll link all this. The place to start if you're interested in following along in more detail would be in the Marston and Hoffman book. So the definition is as follows. Uh, a linear fractional transformation or transform. There's no difference. If I say transform or transformation, that's just because they're, it's encoded with both words in my head. Uh, is a degree one rational complex function of the form T of Z is AZ plus B over CZ plus B with the additional condition that AD minus BC is not equal to zero. That quantity should look familiar to you by the way. Sure looks like the determinant of a two by two matrix, which means somewhere down the road, we may sneak in some linear algebra matrix representations of these things too. So there's all, this is another place where a bunch of different kinds of math all come together. So for now, we'll leave this alone. Question though would be, why do we exclude this case? It's up in the notes too. I'm not gonna tell you the answer, you can think about it. Question. Why is this excluded? Okay. Um, oftentimes, it's shorter just to write LFT for linear fractional transform. So this is an abbreviation, especially when I have to write it on the board. Um, and then the thing about LFTs or linear fractional transforms. They are complex functions of degree one. Uh, they have so like T of Z is equal to AZ plus B over CZ plus D has a simple pole or pole of order one. At Z is equal to minus D over C and it has a zero of order one. Z is equal to uh, minus B over A. They're, they're simple functions, right? Function is analytic everywhere except that it's pole. And the idea is that these are sort of the basic building blocks of uh, conformal maps in some sense, or the theory of, of conformal maps. First thing is, uh, it's a proposition. We let T of Z be equal to AZ plus B over CZ plus D be a linear fractional transform. Then T is bijective and conformal. From the set A, which is say C without uh, that single point where we're bad, so Z is equal to minus D over C, to the set B, which is the complex numbers uh, minus the point where W is equal to minus D. I have this backwards. I've done something wrong with the notes here. 
about to fix that. Okay. So let me come back and uh, make sure that I fix this at some point here. So I'll be careful with the sets in a second. We'll say on A. And this should be to the set B, uh, where it's C without a point that we will write down when I write down the, the inverse. So if I claim that it's bijective, I'm saying that the function has an inverse. I don't remember the formula for the inverse off the top of my head. So the inverse function, t inverse of w is equal to minus dw plus b over cw minus a. It actually tells you where the what point is excluded in the, in the inverse, right? So w can't be equal to a over c. You just solve for it. This is like, it's literally just a, like, I mean, the proof of this is going to be, I'm going to write the, plug one formula into the other and show that z falls out. Right? I mean, it's, it's just literally a, like a proof by uh, computation. And this is also, this t inverse function, because we already know about bijective conformal maps, it shouldn't surprise you. The t inverse is also bijective. The right form. So note that T inverse is also normal. Okay. okay. So essentially what the proof of this boils down to is the fact that the function is analytic. T is, is analytic. Okay, so off of the set that excludes this one point, T is analytic. And off of the set that excludes this one point, uh, the function let T be AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And we let the function S be equal to uh, minus w plus b over c w minus a. t is analytic on the set a because we've excluded its pole. s is analytic on b since we've excluded its pole. So really, they're already analytic. So then if we want to finish this up, all we got to show is that these functions are inverses of each other, which will get us the bijection. These are inverses. We're going to get from this set to this one, we'll get the bijection that we're looking for after. So the proof is, this is one of the ones where I get to say left to the reader, because like the proof. So now, all you have to do is show that S or that T of S of W is equal to Z, which is algebra. Okay. Now, it, it, that algebra is going to rely on the fact that we have an excluded value of uh, Z here, an excluded value of W here, and the fact that by definition, we know that AD minus BC can't be equal to zero. So there's going to be one step in the algebra manipulation only to know that. Okay. So go ahead and do it. <laughs> I don't find algebraic like manipulations particularly enlightening. So if you want to mash some rational functions around, you are welcome to do so. Basically, take that formula and plug it into T and show that what falls out the other side is Z. I wish it was Okay. Um, now, conformality, what do we need to, so if, if you do this, so the conclusion here will be is that S and T are analytic, 
and S is equal to T inverse. So we have analytic and bijection. What are we missing for conformality? Non-zero derivative, right? So we have one more step to go here, which is to say that uh, the derivative of at least one of these functions is not zero. Why am I allowed to get away with just one of the functions not being zero? Because the inverse function theorem says that you can calculate one of the derivatives by looking at the reciprocal of the other one, right? So we proved that last time. And so this is one of these really funny like observations. Here's the proof that we don't have zero derivatives. To show that t prime of z is not equal to zero, observe. One is equal to the derivative of z. which is equal to the derivative, well, what's z equal to? One of the convenient things that z is equal to is s of t of z. But I can use the chain rule to say that this is s prime of t of z times t prime of z. But now I've got something not zero being equal to a product of two functions for all z, which means neither one of them can be zero. In fact, we can even, if you want, if you guys really want to beef up your 248 level, level you know, methods of proof here, you could invoke the zero property. By the zero property, neither one of these things can be zero. So t prime of z cannot be equal to zero. And so t is conformal. And because conformality is preserved by inverses, also t inverse is conformal. All That's nice. OK. So here is where I get to say something. Uh, yep. Yeah. Please. I, uh, how do we know that there are no zero divisors in the field of complex functions? Well, these aren't, right? We're, these are just scalars. This is a scalar expression. So we're not working over an algebra of functions here. This is just a oh. scalar expression. You pick a z, right? Any z that you plug in, you produce two scalars. So this is the scalar zero property. There's no weird quotienting thing running around the background or like some subset of zero divisors. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's like, that's one of those things where you got to be careful. But I mean, you're right. If we were thinking about an algebra of functions instead, we, we would have to be a lot more careful about, like, showing that something is an algebra, for example. Okay. All right? Yeah. yeah. If you didn't understand that question, don't worry about it. Everything is okay. Things are nice. We're working in nice land. Okay, so one hook that we can make here is that actually, so I'm going to well actually my own theorem here. Well actually, we could just define a value. I mean, if we have t of z is equal to az plus b over cz plus d, and we know this takes the set a, um, uh, which is c without the point at uh, minus d over c, it sends it over here into the set C, but where we're missing the point, whatever it was, uh, minus A over D. Is that right? A over C. We could fix this. It's kind of annoying to have a function. It's kind of annoying to have a function that has deleted one value. If only there was a convenient place where we could send it. Positive A over C. What if I wanted to make this function have a value everywhere? Like, you know, this goes over to C, but it deletes a value. What if I want this thing to have a value for every possible input? Could I make T of minus D over C equal to something useful? I gotta put it somewhere. Yeah, maybe we're just like 
So we're just abusing the hell out of them. everything your 141 professor tells you not to do, we're going to do right here, which is infinity is actually a number. So infinity is a number. And I'm just going to say, well, it, it's a pole. It's a simple pole, right? So as we approach the pole from every direction, this is one of the behaviors that poles have. If you're in the complex plane, and say this axis is the modulus of f, let's say, t of z, and there's a point right here at minus v over c. Say that point is z naught is minus d over c. As you approach that point in the complex plane, what will happen to the modulus of the function t, this is why it's called a pole, is that it will sort of have this surface where it sort of sends every direction in modulus up to infinity. So in some sense, in absolute value, this thing does converge to infinity. So let's just say, sure, why not? t of minus d over c is equal to infinity. Beautiful. Now what's really going on here is we're saying that this is really kind of a map on the Riemann sphere running around in the background, right? But the idea is, if you don't want to have the Riemann sphere yet, because we have not formally defined it, we can define what's called the extended complex plane. Um, I guess we can use c hat. And c hat is just c unioned with the point at infinity. And if you make that addition, this thing is conformal on all of C. Don't look at me like that. We fixed it. Now it's conformal everywhere, see? So with this patch, T is conformal on C. It is. I'd say it's a bijection on the sphere. I just said it's conformal. What do we do about this derivative? It's a good question. I'll let you think about that. In fact, I mean, so I mean, just think about it for a second. If in modulus this thing is like is is whipping off to infinity, one thing that you could show, you, what you could actually. The idea here is to think about what's happening in the sphere. Right? Because in the sphere, what's happening is you're, you're, you're not losing any information as you come up. So it's a good question. I am not going to, so maybe I should be more careful here. I'm going to say this without proof right now. What you should think, right, for the first thing is you should think, so, in some sense, it's analytic if we do this assignation. And then with a little bit more work, which may show up in an exercise, then we can think about, then we can think about what it would mean to be conformal at a point that's being sent to infinity. It's not what the derivative being zero means in this sense, because it's a two-dimensional derivative. I, I'm, I'm, I know, but I so I have a younger brother who used to troll me by asking me questions that like he knew I knew the answer to that were really obvious, and so I've been trained over my whole life to answer every question, <laughs> which is which is a strength when you have little kids and a weakness in the classroom. So, because I'm capable of being, like, I am definitely one of those professors that's capable of being trolled into wasting time, like I'm doing right now. Okay, um, right, so, we should think real quick about what sort of functions show up in here. So one of the homework questions I asked you guys was to show that if you have something like f of z is equal to az plus b, I asked you guys to tell me, like, why this thing represents a rotation, a uh, magnification, and a scalar shift, right? This is one of the homework questions from this week. And the idea was that you could write f of z is equal to, if I just took a function of the form az, and I wrote that down, well, you could think about that as r e to the i theta, so you replace a with its polar form, multiply it by some complex number z, and you can see that anything of this form where a was constant, magnifies every complex input by multiplying its uh, input by r, its uh, radius by r, and it rotates it by an angle of theta. So the function az represents a magnification by r and a rotation by theta. 
And the thing is, you could get that function out of the class of linear fractional transformations without violating the idea that AD minus BC is not zero, because if you have T of Z is equal to AZ plus B over CZ plus D, and you let D equal one, and you let B equal zero, and you let uh, C equal zero, And I guess you probably also want to say A is not zero because the thing that destroys every number is not really my very interesting function. It also has the root of zero everywhere. Um, if you have D is one and B is zero and C is zero and A is not zero, then this function is the function AZ. And we're still a linear fractional transformation because A times D minus B times C is not zero. So this is in the family of linear fractional transformations. So one thing linear fractional transformations can do is they can magnify by a radius uh, and they can rotate by an angle. So you can sort of pick your way through various cases here. It's also the case that if you wrote down TZ is equal to Z plus B by selecting A is equal to 1 and B is equal to 1 and C is equal to 0, what does this do? So if you started with a point, so here's B up here, and here's, uh, say, I don't know, there's B, thinking of it as a vector, here's an input Z down here, if you apply the map T, this is where you get translation, right? So every input Z has been like translated to the point Z plus B. This is translation by B. Yep. So in these transforms, all the coefficients are complex? All, yeah, so this is, these are not real values. So when we're talking about these things, A, B, C, and D are complex elements, yeah. Now, the real versions of these also make sense. You can define these things for real values as well, uh, but that's a pretty limited subclass of them. Sorry, I should have pointed that out when I wrote the definition down. What's the last thing to talk about? Oh. So that gets us the magnification, rotation, and translation that I asked for when I was talking about just AZ plus B in the homework question. The additional structure that you get with this, so when I look at this, I think, okay, so that's a rotation, a rotation, a magnification, and a translation, and then the inverse of a different rotation, translation, and magnification. So we should understand what inversing does as well, geometrically. Right? If we feed in inverse, what does that actually do geometrically? So this is not reflection across the circle, which we'll get to. Um, if you think about the function t of z is equal to 1 over z, and you wrote this instead as 1 over r times e to the minus i theta. So this sort of reflection does two things. It does take the reciprocal of the radius to sort of like reflection across a circle, which I'll show in a picture. And then it changes the angle by taking the negative of the angle. So if you wrote a point Z down in the complex plane, so you have a Z up here, which is R E to the I theta, the positive I theta. So you rotate it up by theta to get here, then the argument gets negated, which is essentially like a y-axis reflection or a real axis reflection. And the reciprocal of the radius uh, is used to calculate where this point is. So that point is at 1 over r e to the minus i theta is 1 over e. So inverting a complex number sort of flips its radius and reflects it across the real axis. And the reason that you should think that a circle might be involved here, is that? Is that? That is conformal. Yeah, 1 over z away from 0, that is a conformal map. Yeah. It's not conformal if you put the z bar in it, though. Yep. So the, yeah, so just using 1 over z is conformal. If you put the z bar inside, then you've picked up something that's like, that's actually reflection across the circle. Yeah, the, the 1 over z bar, you have to bar that again, which gets you the. <coughs> so.
So why do I keep saying reflection across the circle? What sort of points are fixed in radius by this? If you take 1 over z, it's anything with radius 1, right? So the unit circle, you don't leave the unit circle if you start in the unit circle here. So if you start with a point outside the unit circle, so this is sometimes I will occasionally call this t, which is the unit circle z If I drew my same picture that I started with, if I start with a z outside the unit circle, z is equal to r e to the i theta, and I took its reflection, I end up inside the unit circle. Right? The reflection of this point is here, at 1 over r e to the minus i theta. But if I started on the unit circle, with just a e to the i theta point, so I have a z here, and I go the other direction. It just reflects down. So this is going to lead to an idea of reflecting points across the circle. You can think here, if you applied the map 1 over z to every point on the inside of the disk, the circle got left alone, but the entire inside of the disk has flipped to the outside on the other side of the map. So this is somehow taking the inside, this 1 over z map takes the inside of the disk and peels it apart and rolls it out to the outside. And it takes the outside of the disk and it peels it to the inside, so it flips. One way of understanding what's happening here, and I'm going to keep drawing these to get you guys used to the idea of the Riemann sphere before I formally define it, is if you actually think about what's happening on the Riemann sphere, what you have is the sphere. There's a circle on it that is the unit circle. And what you're doing is you're taking the, uh, a point on the bottom half of the sphere, and you're just lifting it up to the top half. Right? So 1 over z is sort of flipping the top and bottom of the sphere when you do that. Now, that may not always be exactly true based on the, stereo, the particular stereographic projection you've used, but at least it means there is a circle on the sphere, and the cap above the circle and the cap below the circle are just being, are just being flipped. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's actually write down an example of one of these things. So. Let's look at t of z is equal to z minus 1 over z plus 1. That's a pretty basic one. And I'm going to make the following claim. Now, we're going to prove this. Probably not this time, but next time. We're going to prove the fact. So there's a theorem that we'll prove next time that says linear fractional transformations map circles to circles. where circles are loosely allowed to include lines as well, because those are circles passing through the plane of infinity. So circles slash lines to circles slash lines. How many points does it take to uniquely determine a circle? There's a geometric fact. I want you to think about it for a second, because Hold on, hold, on, hold up how many hands, you, like on your hand, how many with your fingers? How many points? I'm curious how many people have seen this before. How? Yeah, I know. Okay, so I'm going to make a claim. There's a minimum number of points that determines a unique circle. A unique circle. So two points determine lots of different circles, right? The question is, how many more points do you need to add in the mix to get a unique one? So it's th it's the answer is three, and the, the reason is, if you think back to your high school geometry, it's one reason anyway, is that any three points that are not collinear form a triangle. Probably at some point in your life you've constructed the, the, the intersection of all the perpendicular bisectors, which is called the circumcenter of a triangle. So the circumcenter of a triangle turns out to uniquely, I'm not even going to try it here, I think I will. Uh, uh, okay, so right there. So. There's going to be a circle centered at that point that uniquely determines the circle that passes through these three points. So three points 
that are non-collinear determine a circle. If they are collinear, then they determine a line. So three points is either going to give you a circle or a line. Any set of three points determines, I'm going to use the word, a unique, man, in the notes I said I wasn't going to do this, clerical. There you go. I said we were going to avoid this dumb word, and here I am using it. But the idea is, if you give me three points, either you get me a line, or if they're collinear, a line falls out. If they're not collinear, you get a unique circle off the other side. That's that? Distinct. These are distinct. I know, I know. I got the definition right. Distinct points. Yeah, we don't want to deal with the degenerate cases here. So distinct points. OK. So what that's going to mean is, if three points that are distinct from each other determine lines and circles, in linear fractional transformations, take circles and lines to circles and lines. To analyze what one of these functions is doing, you only ever have to look at three points. What the hell is this doing? What if I give you an input to analyze? Let's say, what does uh, t of z do to the real line? So we're going to feed it the real line. Here's the real line here. That's the real line. And we're going to map through t, and we're going to end up with something. Now, the real line is a clerical. I can't believe I'm recording myself on video saying that word. The real line is a circle through the point of infinity. So after it passes through the linear fractional transformation, for now, take it on faith that this is going to preserve the fact that this is what comes out of this will be a line or a circle. So if I can find three input points on the line, those three points will determine something on the output side. Well, let's see what they determine. Might pick some nice points to calculate the values of. What's that? Zero, one, minus. Zero, one, and minus. Those are some good ones. All right. Zero, one, and minus one. When you're doing this sort of analysis, it's often useful to pick the most obvious points you can find. In fact, maybe we should use different symbols here so we can keep track of what's happening. So maybe a, a circle and a triangle and a square so I can determine exactly which point is being sent where. Where does zero go in this map? Zero goes to negative one. OK. So the point at zero went to f of zero, which is minus one. So that's the image of the point zero. Where does minus one go? Infinity. Oh, OK. So the image of, as soon as you know that, that means this is going to be a line, because one of the points got sent to infinity. So because a line came in, either a circle or a line comes out. But a circle passing through the point of infinity is a line. right? I, this, I'm doing this, this is not a hard example, but I'm doing it to get you used to the idea this is how this geometry works. right? So that map sent something on this line to the point of infinity, which means a line came out the other side. OK, so we're going to store that information. This point is at. Uh, infinity, which is f of uh, minus 1. See, you, you're, you should be shuddering that we wrote that down. But you know what? We're allowed to do so. Where does 1 go? 0. OK, so 1 went right here. Oh. OK, any three points determine a unique line in the complex plane, including those that go through the point of infinity. So what came out? The real line came out the other side. The line goes through these two points, and then also out here, it passed through the point at infinity on both sides. <coughs> yep? I'm just confused how a one to one map is not mapped like a circular line to a different circular line as long as it's three distinct It has to do with the fact that the. Um, so these maps are. So every analytic map with non zero derivative is rigid, right? So it's angle preserving. 
if you drop the condition that you have, um, so like an easy thing to do would be look at what does z squared do? z squared is perfectly analytic function, right? What does z squared do at zero? Now we did this example where we looked at the effect of z mapped to z squared and we looked at what that did to lines through there. What came out of a line through the origin when you did that was something that was distorted. You didn't get a line or a circle off the other side. You got something that had been stretched in a weird way. So parabolic arcs come out that go through there. So circles through the origin don't stay circles through the origin. Z squared doesn't take circles to circles. Right? Yep. In this example, I mean that we get a line, but how do you know if one of the points goes off to infinity and you don't get a giant circle? <laughs> It is! Look at it! It's a giant circle! It's the biggest possible circle! How much bigger could it be? It got all the way there, man! So, in the Riemann sphere, the idea is that what's happening here is that, sure. this, that this map is really taking a great circle to a great circle. The answer is, it really is the case that this, this is part of the reason why we introduced the extended complex plane, so that we can actually say only one of the... It's a linear fractional map, right? Oh, so we have degree one. So it's a degree one rational. It can only send one single point to infinity. There's just one place where that can happen. So you can't get multiple points sent to infinity and get some sort of like loop that passes through the, the infinity twice. Although it is possible if you start increasing the degree of your maps and you're working on Riemann surfaces, which is beyond the scope of the course, but fascinating. So yeah, it's only because these maps are so simple. Right? These are the building block maps. They only do this with one point can get out to infinity. If they send a point to infinity on the line that you've drawn, then that function um, sends lines to lines on the input. If it doesn't go to infinity on the line that you've drawn, then you send the line to a circle instead. In fact, we're gonna let's do the imaginary axis. Let's walk this. So what does get on the Riemann sphere? Was take circles and just rotate it? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this on the Riemann sphere. Yeah. If you're curious about the geometry here, now the one thing to keep track of is. It, it may not just be a rotation. We could actually keep track of where, which side of the plane got sent to which side. So if you put in the point I, well, if you put in the point I, right? That would tell you, okay, so I is in the upper half plane, right? So if you put I in here, you get I minus one, so F of I is equal to I minus one over I plus one. Oh man, I'm gonna have to simplify this. All right, so it's i minus 1 squared divided by, you know, this is like, um, so I should do what? So i plus 1 times i minus 1. Clear out the complex conjugate there. Yeah? So I get minus 1, I guess so minus 2, so I have i. i squared minus 2i plus 1 divided by minus 2 which is one, or sorry, negative sets minus two i over minus two, which is i, so yeah, it is just a rotation in this case. Now, why do I say that? I put an input value in, I tracked to see what its output turned into, and with conformal maps, it's enough, once you know what happens to the boundary, to track one point in the interior, in, in, in one side of this thing, we'll keep track of what the map did. So we put in the point at i, we got out the point at i, so somehow this fixed to the point at i, and that meant that the entire upper half plane got mapped to the upper half plane. Yep. And since the ordering of our circle and diagonal points are they are great circles, I don't know. Yeah. Sort of. So, it, so, so, what you should, yeah, so what you should think here is this thing twisted, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all these points stayed in the same spot, yeah. right? Here, you want even more infinite geometry weirdness? Square, circle, triangle, square, circle, triangle. So Madeline's pointing out that the order stayed the same, right? So this really is, if you think about this as a circle, all we've done here is slide the real line this way, where we took that end and stretched way out here, right? So we've slid this, and even though this point stayed the same, it doesn't mean the rest of the points also stay in the same spot. If you imagine you were on a sphere and you took it and you twisted it around an axis of rotation, you can twist the circle and preserve like the order that the points are in when you do that, but it's gonna bend the way that these points are set up inside here. 
Squares don't map to squares. Triangles don't map to triangles, right? Things are going to be, in fact, a good exercise would be, well, this is a good exercise. <laughs> Maybe I should make you do it. <laughs> Figure out what happens to a triangle that you draw up here. Because if you look at the image of a triangle, you'll get to see something about what the function is doing to the points up here, how the geometry up here is changing. You might think, oh, in fact, my friend who works at University of Florida gave his students this question in their complex analysis class. True or false? Could, could linear fractional transforms take circles to circles, and can formal maps preserve angles? Is the image of a triangle a triangle? After all, 180 degrees in, 180 degrees out, right? I mean, that's true. They, the curves have tangent lines that intersect at 180 degrees, so why is the image that comes up the other side not a triangle? Because the line between Because you're going to end up not with straight lines anymore, necessarily, right? Especially when you have something that's doing distortion. Right. These, even in a linear fr fractional transformation, are going to be arcs from circles that are intersecting with each other. You're going to end up with something called a hyperbolic triangle. Okay, so I'm going to actually add that to the questions, like to that true-false question about triangles and also like to do an image track of triangles here, because I really want you guys to get a feel for what's actually happening. Let's look at the imaginary axis real quick. We can even use the same input. So, same map, but this time, let's keep track of what's happening to this axis. Okay, so this... I have to use the same points. Oh, I don't want to calculate this again. Okay, so here we get to. What's that? I did an I. I got one more. No, I know I got one, but I'm just thinking about doing basic, very beginning of 410 complex analysis, and it's irritating me. Okay, so here's I, and here's zero, and I got to pick one other point. Negative I. Negative I. Oh, yeah. Okay, there you go. All right, now, I already know. Where did zero get sent to? Minus one. So zero got sent to minus one. I got sent to I. So there's zero. I got sent to I. Where's minus I go? Yeah. Are these functions linear? No. Oh. You know what, man? Okay. <laughs> In the sense that if you, instead of using clerkles, you use like lines or something, I guess you could say, <laughs> that lines in produce lines out. But no, I mean, they're linear in the numerator and linear in the denominator. Wait, question. Yeah. Can you track the point at infinity instead of seven point two? Uh huh. You absolutely you can track the point at infinity. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Okay. So, yeah, here's the, here's the advanced technique is infinity counts as a point. So, you're absolutely allowed to plug infinity into one of these things. Absolutely. So yeah, instead of doing minus i because you hate complex geometry, instead you're going to do like, whoa, man, I'm going to psychedelically calculate where the point of infinity went, dude. So here's infinity down here. Infinity's on the imaginary axis, right? Sure it is. It's, it's down there. Where does it go when you plug it in? Here's the thing again. Don't show any calculus student that you did this. What's t of infinity? Yeah, the way to think about it is you take a limit, right, where you can like pull through by 1 over z's and set 1 over z's equal to 0. So you get 1 out the other side here. So the point at infinity maps to 1. Okay, now, every one of those is what distance? I mean, uh, granted, those are three points. Are they collinear? No. Is infinity involved? Yes. No. Over here? No. no. Okay, so a circle is going to be the, the shape that goes through those three points, right? Which circle is it? It's the unit circle because these are all distance one from the origin. So you get the unit circle on the other side. So the imaginary, this is a function that takes the imaginary axis and pushes it over to the unit circle. Where did the interior of this set go? So let's just, here is the point one. Where does one get sent by this map? One got sent to zero. So this is a linear fractional transform that takes the right half plane and somehow takes the real axis and wraps it around itself and squeezes this right half plane into the disk. 
And then you can track more about the local geometry by drawing what happens to a triangle inside here. But yeah, so this is a, and as weird as this seems, these are the building blocks of why we do this, is that you can get from these infinite domains to bounded domains. Yep. Which, um, sorry, I, I, how can you have the circle with the entire ring have the plane and the real line <laughs> the same place? Because this part of it, if you, if you took one more like segment here, so this bit right here, that goes right here. Oh, okay. So there, there's the image of the right half line is, is like on this axis right here. Yeah. All right, so we'll do more of this next time. We'll compute more examples. The first two questions on the homework are gonna ask you to start grappling with this stuff, right? So go ahead and compute some images and get yourself used to this.